So the, the general rule for initial conditions, and this is true not just in differential equations, but overall whenever you have undetermined uh, constants, each initial condition generally gives you one uh, constant value. So if we have n constants, you would generally need n initial conditions to figure them all out. up that last example we did. <clears throat> I'm just going to write the uh, solution that we wrote down. <coughs> so we had y equals e to the x plus c over 2x squared. plus C1x plus C2. And I want these constants to be labeled similarly, so I'm just going to keep that pattern going. So I'm going to call the first constant C0, just so they all have a nice subscript, so they kind of look uniform. How many initial conditions will I need? So I'll need at least three initial conditions to get these. So I'll write those down. So we're <coughs> given that, uh, equation I just wrote down and given the initial conditions <coughs> and so I'm using notation similar to the book your web work problems are probably written in a more modern way but it's all the same information I think that's and yeah a lot of people still write like this too So these initial conditions don't have any derivatives in them. So initial conditions don't have to have derivatives. They could just be like different, in this case, different x values and different y values. So these will all be points right here. So let's go ahead and plug these in. So we'll go, I'll just plug them in order. I'll do the first one first. So we'll go y of 0 equals 2. And if I use the formula for y, I have well, first of all, which variable is 0 and which variable is 2? X is zero. So x is 0, y is 2. If you switch them around, obviously, it's going to be a huge difference. So make sure you know what's x, what's y. And you can absolutely write it down if you want. x comma y equals 0 comma 2. So if you want to write x and y separately, uh, go for it. Are these solving for what the c's are? Yep. So we'll figure out. Uh, <clears throat> now, when I said... Up here, usually, each one usually determines a constant. Uh, you won't, sometimes you'll have to plug in all three, and then you get a th system, three equations and three unknown constants, and then you'll have to solve that system. So you won't necessarily immediately know one of the constants, the first one you plug in. Sometimes you will, but we'll see what we get here. I think this one, we will. So I got e to the 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus c2. And e to the 0 is 1, so we got 2 equals 1 plus c2, so c2 equals 1. Now, you should be able to tell if x wasn't 0, I would not, I'd have <coughs> probably all three constants hanging around. But we got lucky, it was 0, so we actually got our constant value. So I'm going to rewrite the equation with this c2 value. So any questions on that first constant we determined? So now I'm going to plug in, that was our first point, or first condition, now I'm going to go for number 
two. So that was one, now we're on two. So we got y of one equals e, which equals, <clears throat> now I'm using the equation right above because I don't want to, I want to use the actual constant value for C2. So I'm using that equation directly above. So we got e to the one plus C0 over two times one plus C1 times one plus one. So we have e equals e plus C0 over two plus C1 <coughs> plus one. So the e's are gonna cancel. So we got one half C0 plus C1. Our e's cancel out and I'll plus one. And I'm going to set this up like a linear system uh, the way we're usually used to looking at linear systems, so we'll have negative one equals one half C zero plus C one. So in this case, I'm going to need another uh, condition in order to determine a coefficient. So this didn't determine a coefficient, but with my next condition, I should have two equations, two unknowns, and we should be able to knock that out. So our third condition, Y of two is e squared plus three. So I want you right now to plug this in, see what you get, and I'll bring that y at the top of the board is the one to use. It's a good time for questions if you have them. plugged it in, see if you can actually get those constant values. I think I picked nice numbers. This is a one, uh, one through three. Okay. Yeah. questions on those two linear equations those are our the results of plugging in the two different values so you should have these two I got two C0 plus two C1 Ooh, two. yep that's what I should have <coughs> and actually before I circle this second equation it's probably smart to multiply everything by a half So how do you solve two linear equations, or a system of two linear equations? Substitution. So we got substitution, elimination, Kramer's rule, 
or basically use a matrix and either go Cramer's rule or elimination. So however you want to do it, I think using a matrix is probably overkill here. So go elimination or substitution. Looks like I'd eliminate C1 as a smart move. C0 is 4 and C1 is negative 3. Any questions on those values? All we're going to do is just reconstruct our original with these constants in place. So this is our final solution with our <coughs> initial conditions already uh, accounted for. So if <coughs> you had the right number of conditions, you shouldn't have any constants left over, any undetermined constants left over. It should just be x's, y's, and numbers. Uh, that was our C naught, or, oh no, did I order that? Oh no, dang, so, wait, uh oh. So that's my one, like that? Yeah. All right. So to check, not only do we have to check that we satisfied that differential equation that we started with yesterday, but we also have to check the initial conditions that we didn't make a mistake on our algebra while we were getting these constants. So not only do we have to go and check, if we wanted to fully check that we satisfied that differential equation, somewhere up here, I think this is our original diff EQ. So I'd have to check does it work here, <coughs> and then separately do those initial conditions work out with the values that I wrote down. <coughs> so we're going to have a very s we're going to do the exact same differential equation. I'm just going to use different initial conditions. Yep, and actually taking the three derivatives of this is very easy. So let's just check that real fast. What is the third derivative of e to the x? e to the x, very good. What's the third derivative of x squared? Zero. Zero. The second derivative is two, but the third derivative is zero. Oh, okay. So the first derivative would be two x, Second derivative would be 2. The third derivative would be 0. I'm ignoring the constant. So nice. you're taking a derivative higher than the degree. And as long as it, you have an integer power, it would be 0. You got to be careful. If this was like uh, the 2 thirds power, then you're going to have negative fractional exponents. So those don't disappear. Uh, and the same thing, uh, the third derivative of the x term, 0, and immediately the first derivative of the constant term zero. So you just get e to the x plus zero and that's the original differential equation we're trying to solve. So we satisfied the diffie q and then you have to check do we still satisfy the initial conditions because I could have made an algebra mistake. 
I probably didn't. I mean, I did, but you guys corrected me. But I feel like even if you would have made a mistake past, I don't know, the so those con x squared, if you take the third derivative of that, you wouldn't really see it. So if I messed up on my initial conditions, if my constants were wrong, <coughs> I'd still be solving this differential equation. What I wouldn't be satisfying is the initial conditions. Because if we go back, the general condition or general solution was written right here. Any constant values you plug in are going to satisfy that differential equation. However, only specific constant values are going to satisfy the initial conditions. Does, it, does that make sense about how this this any constants will solve the differential equation? But only very specific constants are going to satisfy the initial conditions. And those are just the first two terms? Or? So, and if we break this down, this there's kind of two parts to this. And the e to the x is the initial condition? No, the indeterminate constants or coefficients are the three terms on the right side. Okay. So, this is what we call the. The whole thing together is, well. <coughs> I'll just define them when we get there in the notes, but there's basically the two parts to this. The initial condition is like the y of 0 equals 2 1. Yeah, these are the initial conditions right here. Uh, okay. The 1, 2, and 3. All right, so I'm going to give the same uh, differential equation, but different initial conditions. So we got same differential equation, which of course is written right there, but I'll rewrite it. Y triple prime equals e to the x. So we already did the hard work of <coughs> finding the general solution. Which e to the x plus c0 over 2x squared plus c1x plus c2. Oh, I see where I messed up. My subscripts and my notes are off by 1. I have c1, c2, c3. That's what got messed up. All right, so initial conditions, we're going to still need three. So our first one will look really similar, y of 0 equals 2. Our second condition, y prime of 0 equals 2. And our third initial condition, y double prime of 0 equals 4. So the first one's exactly the same, so I'm just going to shortcut and write down what it gives us. So it gave us our C2 equals 1. So our first condition gave us that C2 equals 1. And now our solution is ready for the next condition. So now we're going to, that was 1. Now we're going to do the second y prime of 0 <coughs> equals 2. What huge mistake did I just make? Oh, I'm supposed to plug a 2 in for the x. Oh. Dang. I made a mistake when I intentionally was trying to make a mistake. <laughs> that was a 2, 0, 0, 0. All right, so I plugged it in in the y of x, not y prime of x. OK? So what I need to do is get y prime. <coughs> if I look back through my uh, work, I have y prime written probably two pages back. But what I'm going to do is just take a derivative of y. It's probably faster than trying to figure out where are my notes I wrote y prime down. So let's find y prime first, so write that down, and then plug in the uh, condition. Y prime of the yep, take derivative of that guy. If the derivative would have been really difficult, I would have looked back at my notes. But this is an easy derivative. So do you use the 
still good to see one. So, well, I have to get y prime. My condition has a y prime. It's it's information about y prime. It's not it's not information about y. So when I plug it in, I have to plug it into the y prime equation. Yeah, no, I mean that you carry down to c one. C one plus c one. I took a derivative of that guy right there. Okay. <coughs> That's y. So I just wrote oh, y prime. Oh, there's an x. Oh, I didn't run the X in my lovely Oh, <laughs> that'll mess you up. <laughs> All right, now I'm ready. Y prime of zero equals two. Now I'm plugging in uh, two, uh, two in for Y prime and zero for X. So we got our C1 is now one. So again, I'm going to plug that C1 value back in and then get an equation with less unknowns. And of course, this is the Y prime. Uh, I can plug back into either one. Actually, now that I think about it, I think it's going to be faster if you can choose which one you plug back into. I'll, I'll plug into Y prime because the next thing I need is Y double prime. So if I plug into regular Y, I'll have to take two derivatives to get here. And completely okay to do that too. But from this one, you can just go just one derivative and be there, right? Yeah. So it's, this is the shorter route to get where we need to go. So here's our new y prime. The only thing that changes c1 is now just 1. So in order to use the initial condition, the next initial condition, it's y double prime of 0 equals 4. So I need to get y double prime. So take another derivative and then plug in. You get three for your c zero constant. Any questions on that last constant? So what is our? We're trying to answer the question, uh, which I didn't write down, but basically solve. So we're trying to find the solution. So the solution is that y y prime or y double prime? What's the actual solution? Y. So I got to reconstruct the Y <coughs> function with all, we got all three constants. So I'm plugging them back into the original Y. You could put them back into Y prime or Y double prime, then you'd have to anti differentiate. So we're just going to go right back to Y because that's our solution. So I'm going to circle these values and then rewrite our oh, Y's written right there. Perfect. <sighs> So we got y equals e to the x, c0 is 3, so we got plus 3 halves x squared plus 1x plus 1. And that should be our solution. Now, I warned you when I wrote down the conditions, I said each condition usually gives you a constant. So we saw an example where it basically took two conditions to get two constants out. One condition only told us how the constants were related. It took the second one to actually determine them. Now I'm going to give you an initial condition that doesn't tell you anything about constants. take our same y, which is e to the x plus c1 
0 over 2x squared plus c2x plus c, know, c1x plus c2. And I'll just write one initial condition, y triple prime of 0 equals 1. Alright, so in order to use this, I need y triple prime, and we just talked about how to get that easily, so I'm just going to skip right down, y triple prime is e to the x, we'll go ahead and plug in y triple prime of 0 equals 1, which is e to the 0, so we get 1 equals 1. How many initial conditions did we learn about? None of them. We got no information that was useful for initial conditions, so not every initial condition will tell you information about constants. What would have happened if I got, let's say instead of y triple prime 0 equals 1, or what if I would have got y triple prime 0 equals 4? What would you say to that right there? So in this case, uh, I would say this initial condition is not possible for this solution. So algebraically we would say no solution, but what that means here is these two things are incompatible. So that can't be an initial condition for this uh, solution. So it's possible you get an initial condition that doesn't match with what's going on. Inconsistent, incompatible. So we'll do some vocabulary now. So if we're given a piece of information like that, we just ignore it because we don't do anything? Uh, no, you would say that uh, basically that condition would, would not be consistent with this uh, solution. But if we were given one that did work? but it just gave us like one equals one? Well then you, s you would say I can't determine any co constants from this. Uh, the initial condition is not, uh, you could say it's basically useless or superfluous if you're going for big words. Nice. <laughs> uh, let's see, we're gonna look at particular solution first. Particular. Answer that. I don't know what you mean by advance. We can talk later. Do you want a pat on the back? Is that what you're asking for? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the right person to ask if you want positive encouragement. <laughs> I'm the one who tells you to work harder and work faster. <laughs> yeah, your friends can give you positive encouragement. <laughs> solution with uh, so this is a solution with uh, determined coefficients. So another way to say it is there are no undetermined coefficients. So that solution we just looked at right there, that is not a particular because it's got three, it has more than zero undetermined coefficients, it's got three undetermined coefficients. But our final solution that we got earlier, this guy is a particular. There's no more constant coefficients that have yet to be determined. So there were three, we filled them all in, so this is a particular solution.
And then the general solution is all possible solutions. So the general solution includes all possible solutions. And it would be what you get before you plugged in any initial conditions. So that would be what you would have before plugging in initial conditions. at an example. All right, we got the fourth derivative equal to the original. This has a lot of solutions. So let's take some guesses. U to the x, I like it. Now, yeah, but so we will get some of the trick stuff. Before we jump into that, could I put a constant coefficient in front of e to the x? So let's go, I'll probably have more than one constant, so I'll start, I'll start with c0. We started with 0 before. All right, is this still a solution? So that constant just hangs out out front, so the fourth derivative will be c0 e to the x. So this is okay. So another choice we said was sine or cosine. Could I put a constant in front of this? So four derivatives. So sine goes to cos, cos goes to negative sine, back to negative cos, back to positive sine. And that constant just stays out front. So here's another solution. <coughs> Same thing for cos. Do you remember hyperbolic cosine from Calc 2, the prerequisite class? No, I think it has a weird antiderivative, but that's true for a lot of those uh, trig functions. Yeah, it goes cosine. No, well, not the inverse. This is a hyperbolic regular trig derivative, not inverse trig. The it Inverse ones are the ones that have more crazy derivatives. I don't think it's on your cheat sheet because I told you I wouldn't ask you about it. <laughs> and because I told you I wouldn't ask you about it, oh, none of you. Yep. It's just like the uh, regular trigs, except they don't get any negatives. So we got two more solutions right here. What do you mean, the ends? Yeah, so yeah, y is, y is 0, but we can actually generalize a little bit. What about y equals c5? Oh, no, I don't think that'll work, actually, will it? No, I think it only works at the constant 0, because your derivative would be 0, not equaling c5, unless it's already 0. Yeah, it's already up here. Doesn't, doesn't it go sine... We're taking four derivatives, so it, so it's going to cycle from cos to sine to cos to sine to cos, and it's going to switch positive to negative twice. Okay. If it was a second derivative, then those those would be out because they'd be negative. But because it went to a fourth derivative, the, they go back to being positive. So if it was a second derivative, these three would be solutions, and the and the zero one. All right, so we got basically six solutions. Let's think about this last one right here. What if I used 
what if I told you had to use this? What value for C0 could you use to get that last solution? Zero. So that last one can be covered by any of these other ones if you just let their constant be zero. So the last one's really redundant because it can be covered by any of these other ones. So I'm going to, it's not wrong, it's just redundant. So there's really five distinct solutions and they all look like this. And all we have to do to write the general is basically add them all together. So we got C0 e to the x plus C1 sine x plus C2 cos x plus C3 cos hx plus C4 sine hx. That is our general solution here. Can that be infinite in law? What's that? Can that be infinite in law? Like infinite in law? Like, are there more guesses that we haven't put that can technically work? Yeah, absolutely. So this may not be the most general. It's relatively easy to check if one of these possibilities is a solution. It is a much harder problem to say there are no other ones that look different from these. That's a way harder thing to answer. So this summation of the uh, smaller solutions is only only works when the ODE is linear. So what in the world does it mean to have a linear ODE? So it has to do with not having higher powers. So what, OD, what linear ODE is not is just uh, zero derivatives and first derivatives. That would be kind of one, that's not the actual definition of linear. What linear means is anytime y appears, or y, y prime, or any derivative of y, it's not raised to any power. So an ODE is linear. When all appearances of the nth derivative of y are not raised to any powers. Yeah, or less, or even square roots, or yeah, any any powers, or neg or reciprocals like one over y or one over y prime. <coughs> Uh, so, for example, if you had even something relatively easy like y prime squared equals y, that's already not linear. <coughs> and what makes it not linear is that square power right there. So even though it only had a first derivative, it's not linear because that first derivative gets squared. Now, why is this the case? Uh, let's think about if you have uh, f plus g. Well, we'll just do first derivative first. So how would you apply derivative to f plus g? Derivative f plus derivative of g. So it looks like that. And this is 
true even if you had higher order derivatives. So if you had a kth derivative, you can just distribute the kth derivative just like that. So derivatives work really nice across sums. <coughs> Exponents do not work really well across sums. You have to basically foil it out, or if it's a third or fourth degree, you have to multiply it out. So this, these are derivative sums and derivatives. And now if we look at exponents and derivatives, or exponents and sums. So even if you don't have a single derivative and your power is just squared, this is f squared plus g squared plus 2fg. So you got your outside, inside uh, to worry about as well. So this is what messes up uh, the sum still being a solution. We'll talk way more about, there's an entire section on linear. So we'll talk way more about linear and these ideas. But this is the reason that I was able to add these five solutions and still have a solution. So if you think about it, the original equation was y quadruple prime. So if we look at this, if I take a fourth derivative right here, I still get the fourth derivative of each term added together. So I would get c1 e to the x fourth derivative plus c2 sine x fourth derivative so this is what I would get I could basically distribute <coughs> my derivative across now let's look at the first term we already determined that this right here equals y we already checked that. So that this right here, we take the fourth derivative, is itself. So we already did that work. That's c1 e to the x right there. Move over. This guy right here, fourth derivative, c2 sine x. And same thing, so they're all solutions. So if we add them all together, uh, we'll get right back to where we started. This will be the sum of all these together, which we just call y. That's what's written right above. That's the same y that's right above us right there. So that's why in a linear ODE, you can just add all the different solutions together. You still get a solution. So direction fields are next. It's a very good place to stop.